Okay, good morning artists. Welcome to Art Adventures. My name is Mr. Andy. I'm the studio programs manager here at the museum, uh, which means I get to make art with people like you that visit uh, the museum all year round. Art Adventures is a weekly program that happens every week here at the museum uh, with our friend Miss Therese. During this time of of self isolation, we're trying to we're trying to keep each other healthy and safe. I'm going to bring art adventures to you each week. Our friend Miss Therese is going to follow along uh, from Therese. from her own home, and she'll be able to uh, answer some of your questions in the comments below. Each week, we will be inspired by a different artist uh, from the galleries and create an own, a masterpiece of our own here in the studio. That uh, while we learn what makes these works of art special. For a full list of all upcoming art adventures, please visit jawson.org, uh, the Art Adventures webpage, for all material, uh, for each, the material list and a description of each week's activity, including uh, new descriptions which will be posted soon for the month of May. If you can't, if you don't have materials ready today, we will post the recording of this video on that webpage so you can make art when you have more time along with a link to Jocelyn's Pinterest board full of videos and pictures about today's artists for you to explore. This week, we're going to blend 2D and 3D to create a drawing that comes off the wall like an artwork in the gallery called Nogaro by artist Frank Stella. We're going to get to know a bit about Frank Stella and learn about color, shape, line, and pattern. Frank Stella is currently 83 years old. This is a picture of Frank nowadays. And he's still making art. Frank uh, became a well-known artist in his early 20s. Frank has been, was born in Massachusetts. This is a picture of young Frank. He's a pretty cool looking guy. <laughs> he's been making art. Uh, he's been making art. Uh, he became well known, a very well-known artist in his early 20s. He was born in Massachusetts and was a smart kid was a smart kid, but also a bit of a troublemaker. And, and when he was a teenager, was sent to a boarding school uh, where to encourage him to focus on his schoolwork. At this boarding school, though, he became inter really in interested in art and was able to explore um, new art techniques because he didn't have to pay for his own materials. This meant he was able to experiment and try new things. He quickly became interested in, um, quick became interested in the abstract expressionist such as Jackson Pollock and William de Kooning, Barnett Newman, and Mark Rothko. And after attending Princeton University, told you he was smart, he went to New York City to be around other artists, museums, and galleries. This was a time before Instagram, before the internet, even when TV was still new. So if you wanted to see what other, other artists were doing, you had to go where the action was. So he quickly moved to New York City and started to um, make more paintings. Although he was inspired by artists like to Kooning and Jackson Pollock, um, Rothko and Barnett Newman. He wanted to create, like many artists, he wanted to create in his own style and do his own thing. And he quickly became recognized for a series of paintings that he made of simple black shapes and lines. These are monochromatic paintings made with just black paint, creating patterns and lines that uh, repeated over and over again. Here's a picture of, of Frank Stella making one of these concentric paintings with rectangles that get smaller and smaller and smaller using black, big, thick black lines with a brush stroke. These paintings had drips and brush strokes like Pollock and de Kooning, but they're also very orderly and controlled like Rothko and Barnett Newman. And uh, Frank Stella's style would, soon, would go on to become minimalism, become called minimalism. Mental molism, <laughs> and uh, go on to influence many artists just like the expressionist had influenced himself. Frank uh, often creates paintings and creates artworks in a series, which means he'll create several works of art that are similar or follow rules that he creates for himself, and then, uh, then go on to break those rules. After painting several black, monochromatic black paintings, he began to create Similar paintings with simple shapes and lines, but now it would introduce lots of bold, bright colors, even day glow colors, sometimes using metallic paints made with copper or aluminum. But, but experimenting with, with pattern and line and simple shapes. 
An example of one of these concentric paintings is, uh, can be found in our own gallery. The next time you're at museum, you can look for this giant painting here by Frank Stella on the wall. And it's hanging next to today's inspiration artwork, Nogaro. This painting is, is, is huge. Some, oftentimes, it, Frank Stella would, would create very huge paintings. You can see how big this painting is here with our lovely team council and standing in front of the giant concentric circles behind it. He went on, uh, in, in these series, he went on to create, uh, to experiment with different shapes and different colors. But uh, like most paintings, these paintings began as a simple, as a, uh, on a rectangle or square canvas. This is another rule that, that Stella broke when he started to build his own canvases of funky shapes. He'd create, he'd build his own canvases, sometimes in the shape of a T or an L, other times combining several shapes to create what he would call irregular polygons. These canvases were often very thick, so they'd come off the wall, which means that the surface would jut out into the space, transforming these paintings into something more like sculpture. Here's what it, some of them were, uh, this is an example of what this would look like if it were cut, cut out. This is how it would hang on the wall. The canvas would be the shape taken from the protractor. These, uh, he continued to make these funky, irregular polygons and then began to experiment with, by combining even more elements of sculpture with his paintings. Making his, uh, taking his paintings and cutting them into shapes that zoomed and spiraled off the wall. In the 80s, Stella, in the 1980s, Stella created a series of these zooming relief paintings inspired by racetracks around the world. Jawson's own painting, Nogaro, this picture, Nogaro, that will be inspired by today, took inspiration from a racetrack in France called Nogaro, in the city of Nogaro in France. So this is, the, in this racetrack, you can see how the cars zoom and along the curved road of the track, and we can see how the cars might zoom around the curved lines and shapes put together in this relief sculpture. These relief sculptures, like Nogaro, were first made in Stella's studio by cutting paper, paper paintings and drawings and assembling them together. He would then, to create a, a maquette or a small model, you take the model or the maquette and give it to an industrial fabricator, someone who usually may make machines or cars, and they would take his small shapes and cut those same shapes out of big, heavy pieces of aluminum, heavy metal, same thing that we make a soda can from. Cut out those, and then take those, give those huge shapes to Frank Stella for him to paint and draw on and assemble to hang on the wall, making his painting, his two-dimensional painting, a three-dimensional work of sculpture. So his paintings would come, would zoom off the wall and swoop and swirl. Frank Stella is still making art, and, and experimenting with sculpture, and experimenting with sculpture in the early 80s, he's, even in the early 80s, in the early days of computers, he was utilizing uh, computer technology to help him create his art. Nowadays, he's taking, he's he's experimenting by capturing smoke, smoke rings, smokes from like a campfire with a computer, and then realizing those sh the shape of the smoke rings in the computer in three dimensions and using three-dimensional three dimensional printing and fabrication techniques to take that, those smoke shapes and bring them into his sculptures. We're going to, be, we're going to create our own small maquette today and learn, a bit, uh, and learn more about Frank Stella as we go along to, really, to get the true sense of what Frank Stella's artwork looks like to really see it and, and experience it, you need, to, you need to see it in person, not through this camera. Um, and, and so the next time you're at the museum, I hope you'll explore the galleries and find Frank Stella's artworks in the museum. But in the meantime, let's watch a short video where we can see Frank Stella in the gallery, surrounded by his artwork um, in a museum in Germany. This, uh, this video comes from a retrospective, which means it includes art throughout Frank Stella's long career. So you'll be able to see art when he made when he was a young a young artist, almost 60 years ago, 
and art, uh, newer works of art. As we go along, look to see if you can recognize his old flat work, work from his mid-career, the works that relief, uh, relief paintings that come off the wall, and see if you can find new works of art, uh, newer works of art that, he, that are even more sculptural. So I'm going to slide the TV in here, maybe turn up your computer so you can hear Frank Stella. You'll be able to hear him answer some questions. He's the one without the German accent. Good there, Jennifer? Yep. All right. So as we go along, we'll be able to see how big these, these works of art are, and we'll be able to, to get a better sense of how they come off the wall and listen to Frank answer some questions. You did a very nice uh, definition of your reliefs. It's just between two dimension and three dimension. This uh, 2.7 dimensional. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason for uh, moving from a, a relatively flat surface or the conventional uh, picture uh, came about with the notion uh, that appears in the, uh, in the Polish village pictures, which was an idea uh, which for me actually was a little bit of a turning back, a kind of turning back towards uh, constructivism, towards Malevich and Tatlin perhaps and Rodchenko, uh, thinking about that, about that kind of geometry. What happened was that I made a lot of drawings and a lot of designs and a lot of maneuvering with geometric forms, but then somehow it came out that I needed to build a, a, a build the painting that I wanted, and uh, and most of these drawings were, uh, came out as shaped canvases, and so it became an, a notion and an idea to build the painting and then paint it or if you want to be brutal about it, decorate it uh, with other surfaces. And so that was, but then that was a way of, of making it my own. The big thing here is there is a lot of room. There's no question about that, but also it, it's still fairly rare to have the light level be so high here. Uh, and uh, it's beautiful for the paintings. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, even though some of the, the light is mechanical, uh, you don't feel it. Yeah. Uh, it feels like it, it's pretty, pretty big mixture. Uh, uh, daylight seems to dominate yeah. even in the dark. <laughs> Sometimes you were criticized in former times that your paintings uh, is an aesthetical uh, approach to the technical world. Oh, you began with the black paintings, right? Uh, the black paintings about, if you think of the paintings right behind us, the black painting, the aluminum painting, uh, the copper painting, uh, those are basically industrial paints, mm -hmm. commercial industrial paints. So. Um, you know, I could say, well, there's art materials and there's art painting, and somehow I must have had some kind of urge to make what we call industrial strength paintings. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so let's make some art, all right? We're gonna take, we're gonna take our inspiration from uh, again, from that work of art in the gallery called Nogaro, which Frank Stella made in the middle part of his career, when he was uh, when he was starting to make his paintings come off the wall to create these relief style maquettes that were then realized in that heavy aluminum metal. So let's before we begin, let's talk about the materials that we'll need today. Some of you may have a material bag from the museum. Others. Maybe you gathered up supplies from around your house, but these are the items that we'll want to have today. Today, we will, first we'll need a, uh, a bit of stiff paper, a bit of stiff paper to use as our support. So stiff paper, that means something that's a little more stiff than regular drawing paper. This, might, this is a thin piece of cardboard, similar to what you might, uh, to a cereal box, 
or a box of Cheez-Its or uh, anything else in your pantry. Um, or you might rip off the cover of a magazine. Rip off the cover of the magazine to use that stiff magazine paper. We'll need a piece, but we'll need a, that stiff paper to use as our support. So take that out of your, uh, put that to the side. And then we'll also need two pieces of colored construction paper. Select two pieces that are maybe opposite. Maybe a warm color and a cool color, a dark value or and a light value. Then we'll need some crayons or drawing, drawing tools to create lines and patterns on, our, on the shapes that we create. We'll need some scissors or uh, to cut out our shapes, or you might choose to tear your shapes today. And then lastly, we'll, just, we'll need our glue stick so we can assemble our cut shapes for the, our maquette. Remember, as we go along, you can watch with me today, and if, uh, if you need to revisit our video, we'll post it to our website. So let's begin, let's start by creating our support. The support for, the mock, for Nogaro in the gallery is this flat shape in the back where all these other shapes are then attached to. So that support is what holds the whole entire piece, which is very heavy, to the wall so it doesn't all fall apart. So we're going to create a support. The support in Nogaro upstairs in the gallery is the shape of uh, like a, the letter L, kind of like this, this support here. So you might choose to cut out uh, the letter L or like the number seven as your support, or you can make us uh, your support any shape that you, you choose. You can even make a support with a hole in the middle. So take your stiff paper and grab your scissors, or if you choose to tear, you can tear your support. And let's cut your support, the shape of your support. So I might make this support an L by cutting this direction and turning my paper to cut another direction. So when I hold it up, I have a, vert a, vertical, a vertical shape and a horizontal plane to attach my shapes to, to create our letter L, number seven, L7. <laughs> or you can take your, your scissors and freestyle a shape. Freestyle a shape like this. Create any shape that you like. And then, uh, because this, this, this support is going to be a part of our sculpture. Much of it will be hidden, but we'll be able to see some of, we'll be able to see that support through the shapes we attach to it. So, we want this to be interesting to look at. So that it's, so we create, so it's part of our, so it's part of our piece. So, grab your crayons. And we're going to start to fill in this entire shape with crazy lines, patterns, and texture, things to make this shape even more interesting and beautiful. And we can, again, we can kind of just freestyle it. We might imagine our crayon uh, like a race car, racing over this shape, around the curves, and back again. Maybe grab another color. Maybe this is, a, this is another car, and they're racing each other. Sometimes it might even be a crash. Take your colors and your uh, and, and and fill in that entire that enti entire shape for your support <laughs> with colors <laughs> patterns you can draw shapes you can keep adding more and more color and shape when you have time i'm going to put this i'm going to put this on pause and move on to our to our next step so we're going to put this to the side so when we're ready we can attach our relief shapes to it and let's make those relief, those relief shapes now. We're going to make our relief shapes from our construction paper. Now our maquette, our small relief painting, is going to be small. I'm going to show you how to make a small relief painting, like Frank Stella's maquettes. But once you know how this is done, you can make yours huge. You can take the same techniques and make and use bigger pieces of paper, make a bigger support, and experiment to see how large you can make to make your own artwork at home. So I, I, uh, I'm starting, what I'm doing now, I'm starting with our two, uh, the two pieces of construction paper that I selected, and I'm gonna use this cool green color and uh, this warm yellow color. But I don't, because we're making a small maquette, 
together. I only need half a sheet of each. So I folded this like a birthday card. Open it up, fold it back the other way. And then carefully tear down the middle. Don't worry if you don't tear that perfectly. Then I can put this over here to use for, to make a, a different artwork. Or if I want to add more shapes later on, I can return, I can come back to that paper. But we only need two half sheets. We're, then we're gonna, but we're gonna take these two half sheets, two half sheets, and fold them in half again to make two smaller halves. So now a smaller birthday card, open it up, flip it open again, lining up my edges to make a crease, tear it apart to make two smaller halves. Do the same, I'm gonna do the same thing to my other half sheet of construction paper, birthday card, fold, open, crease, crease, tear, tear, two smaller halves. So now I have four pieces, two green and two yellow. Before we begin to cut these up, we're going to imagine racetracks in your head, just like Nogaro. Imagine a racetrack uh, with all the curves and straightaways, maybe a figure eight, and we're going to draw a racetrack on each smaller piece of paper. So grab your crayons, maybe choose a dark color, like blue, purple, or black, and let's draw our first racetrack. I'm going to show you this first, and then you can follow along with, the, with, the, with my second racetrack. But let me show you how, uh, how I recommend drawing a racetrack on your piece of paper. Our starting line is going to start on the edge. That's where the green light's going to go. Where we, where we start our engines. And I'm gonna make my race, I'm gonna start my racetrack on this bottom edge here and draw and curve around and around and around and around. And then my, my finish line is gonna be somewhere in the middle. Somewhere, I want my finish line to be far from the edge. So I have my green light here and we zoom and curve this way and curve around this way. Careful not to hit the wall here, and then when we get to our finish line, right here in the middle. This way, when we cut it out, we'll have one. We'll be able to stretch it and twist it and bend it and have one long, one long shape. So that's one racetrack. Then I can put that to the side and draw my next racetrack. So you can draw along with me on this one. Start. Pick a side you want to start on. Maybe this time I'll start on the left side. My green light will be here, and I'll zoom with a straightaway and zoom back this way, and then zoom around this way. One more curve, and then I'll, my finish line will be right there. I like to make a line so I know that's where I'll stop when I start to cut. So my, my green light's here, and I zoom from the edge around and around until I hit the finish line. I need to make two more racetracks. So this time, maybe we'll, I don't know, where are we? Talagate, Talag, somewhere in go. Florida, yeah. <laughs> Some of you, maybe you know a racetrack, you can type in, in for me if you're a race car fan. This one's going to go around and around with my finish line right there. So I zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom to my finish line on the end. One more. This time I'll make a purple racetrack. This one I'm going to start on the top, I think. Then I'm going to zoom this way, curve, curve, over here <laughs> until I hit my finish line right there. All right, so now I have four racetracks. Racetrack number one, two yellow racetracks, and two green racetracks. But before we begin to cut these racetracks to assemble into a relief painting like Nogaro, we need to make these even more interesting to look at. We're gonna, like we did for our, our support, we're gonna fill each of these racetracks with line and pattern. So you can imagine, again, you can imagine that you're a race car following that track around and around and around to create a concentric, concentric shapes, shapes that repeat, lines that repeat, that get smaller and smaller. I might fill in one racetrack full of polka dots. This racetrack has the measles, we'll put polka dots all over the place, like this. This racetrack maybe is full of stripes. Think about how you can create pattern using lines, or different shapes for each of your racetracks. Use different colors that repeat to make your racetracks even more interesting to look at. More for our eyeball to bounce around. So 
So I'm going to quickly, quickly add a, some more interest to this final racetrack. You, hopefully, after you've practiced this once with me, can take even more time to fill each of your racetracks full of all kinds of shapes. You might even choose to flip your racetrack over and add pattern to the back. In just a moment, I'll show you how we will cut and assemble these race tracks to our support. And as we assemble each race track, we'll twist and turn. So you may, you may, we'll see the front of our race tracks, but you might even see the backside. So this is another way to create, to make your, to add even more texture and pattern and interest to our finished, our finished maquette. So go ahead, add a few more lines and shapes. Create a few more patterns and then push pause and we'll go and we'll get ready to assemble each racetrack onto our support. So we're going to we're going to cut along each racetrack and then adhere using our glue stick one end, maybe the, the starting the starting line to uh, one part of our support, stretch and twist and decide where our finish line will be by putting a dab of glue on the other end of our support. And our racetracks will be able to zoom and, and, uh, and cr crisscross under each other so that when we, so our eyeball can be like a race car and travel along throughout this entire piece. So let's, uh, let's start by cutting our first racetrack. Again, you might, this is a good time, maybe watch as I cut my first racetrack and then you can cut with me when I begin my second racetrack. So grab your scissors, or if you choose, you might choose to tear your paper. But remember with our scissors, we're going to take large <laughs> bites with our scissors, putting the paper in the back of the scissors, in the very back of the scissor, to cut along that line. Try to stay close to your racetrack line, and when you get to a curve, instead of turning your scissors around, turn your paper. Follow that racetrack line, my red line here, from the starting line, cutting carefully as we get around and around and around until I get to the end, the finish line, I'm going to stop. And now I have, I can stretch out this long piece and put it to the side to, until I'm ready to assemble. So that's racetrack number one. Go ahead, grab your scissors, find, start at the starting line, start your engines. Three, two, one, go. Cut along the racetrack. Curve around the edges. Don't, careful, you don't want to trade any paint with the cars around you. Come around and around and around and around. And stop at the stop line. Racetrack, the racetrack number two. So now I've, take, now I've taken my flat racetrack drawing, and now I can open it up and create a three-dimensional uh, racetrack sculpture. Let's go on to number three. Keep cutting your racetracks at home. Set them aside once each one is cut. And I'm going to go number three. Now I can maybe, uh, now I've warmed up my engine. I can cut a little more quickly. Follow that racetrack around and around. Until I get to the finish line, and there's racetrack number three. Start at, your, at the green light, round and around, to create our final, to cut away our final racetrack. All right. So, it's like, our engine's cool, you can cut. If you haven't got if you haven't cut all of your racetracks free yet, that's A-OK. -okay. Push pause for now and grab uh, grab your first racetrack and let's 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 uh, talk about how we'll how we want to attach these to our support. Grab a racetrack, stretch it out, <clears throat> and decide which end is going to be your starting line and your finish line. And, and then Decide where you want your starting line, your starting line to begin on the support. Pick up that starting line, give it a couple twists around. Give practice, practice, uh, practice one direction, 
one placement and then take a look at another placement. Choose the one that's most interesting. Oftentimes that first, that first idea we have it may not be your best idea, so try, try it a couple different, couple different ways. I like this. Once I've experimented, then we grab our glue stick. Glue stick. Glue stick. Grab your glue stick. Flip your, flip your, uh, flip your racetrack over and put a little dab of glue right on the back side of your starting line and the back side of our finish line. And just press it down. You might even choose, oh, we'll do that for our next one. So there's my first racetrack. Now for my next racetrack, I'm, I'm gonna maybe, I'm gonna, to create a pattern, I'm gonna go yellow, green, yellow, green. This one I might take my racetrack, stretch it out, Maybe put some folds in here. Maybe fold it one direction, the other direction, like an accordion, to make this this racetrack even more. Give it some more interest. This time I might put a glue, a little bit of glue on the front side of my on the starting line, and maybe on the back side of the finish line. So I can put my starting line down, twist it around, maybe have it go in and come back out under my yellow starting line squeeze down your ends Hold. when you're working with a glue stick it's good to maybe squeeze count to five and let that glue that let that glue really stick on to our to the surface to our cardboard surface you dig all right let's keep going so i did yellow Green, now it's time for another yellow racetrack. Grab your glue stick. Practice, now we have to really figure out where do we have room? What kind of room do I have left? We want this to look interesting. We don't want it to look messy. So I need to decide where's the most perfect spot. Maybe it comes up off the top to create this roller coaster peak from the top around to the other side. I like that. So before you put your glue on, maybe practice a couple positions to decide where the best position will be for each of your each piece, each next piece that you add. Stretch it out here to create this big roller coaster loop. Squeeze, maybe count the five down here. One, two, three, four, five. Take my other end, I'm going to loop it all the way down over here, like this. Now I only have one more piece. If you have a larger support and you have room for more pieces, you can create, you can keep adding more and more shapes, draw more and more racetracks. Taking time to practice your placement for each one until you have just just the right piece in place. So that one before went up top. Maybe we need one down here now at the bottom to balance that out. So I've squeezed and squeezed, put glue on each end, the starting end and the back end for that final piece. So now I can step back and look, maybe hold it up against the wall and look at the shadows. When you visit the museum and look at the artwork in the gallery, one of the most interesting parts of the shadows that these relief paintings create. Take a look, decide, if I, if I look at it, if I stand back and look and decide this piece is in the wrong spot, you can carefully peel it away or just tear it off and make yourself a new racetrack. I could continue to add more and more pieces and imagine what this would look like, huge. Imagine what these shapes, with these paper shapes would look like if you gave them to a, a industrial fabricator and had them cut them out of big pieces of aluminum that you could then paint and draw on too, just like Frank Stella did to create Nogaro upstairs in the galleries. So I hope you'll continue to experiment, maybe make several uh, relief paintings or relief drawings like this. And the next time you're at the museum, explore the galleries and look for Nogaro by Frank Stella. Thanks for making art with me today. Come back again next week for, uh, for another art adventure. And be sure to visit our website. We'll post today's recording of this lesson to uh, today's event page on the on our on Jason's Facebook page. 
That recording can also be found on the website, along with links with videos and pic more videos and pictures of our pal Frank Stella. And uh, coming next week, we'll post descriptions for new Art Adventures Live happening every Wednesday through May. Friday. Friday. Fridays. Every Friday. <laughs> 10 30. Every Friday. Same Nobody time. Knows what day it is. Sa same time. Yeah, days no, ma no longer matter. But I'll see you a week from now. Same time to make more art. And, and as long as we, uh, until we're able to have you back here in the studio, we'll keep bringing art adventures to you. So I'll see you next week. Adios. Thank <laughs> you.